Hello, I'm Katherine Cyphers. I'm a faculty member and the chair of the photography program at the College DuPage. And I'd like to welcome you to the first lecture for the Visiting Artist Series 21-22. The Visiting Artist Series is a collaboration between the Cleve Carney Museum of Art and the Fine Arts, Architecture and Photography programs at the College of DuPage. And I'd like to thank Multimedia Services for producing our virtual series. Today, we are joined by the artist, Krista Franklin. Krista Franklin is a writer and visual artist, the author of Too Much Midnight, the author of Under the Knife, and the chapbook study of Love and Black Body. She's a Helen and Tim Meyer Foundation of Arts Achievement Awardee and the recipient of the Joan Mitchell Foundation Painter and Sculptor Grant. Her visual art has been exhibited at the Poetry Foundation, Kunsthal C, Rootwork Gallery, Museum of Contemporary Photography, Studio Museum in Harlem, the Chicago Cultural Center, the National Museum of ne Mexican Art, and the set of the 20th Century Fox Empire. She's been published in Poetry, Black Camera, The Offing Vinyl, and a number of other antho anthologies and artist books. And I'm really happy to welcome Krista here today. Thank you, Catherine. I appreciate you inviting me. Thank you so much to the College of DuPage. Thank you so much to Cleve Carney Museum of Art. It's so beautiful to be here. Um, I'm going to be reading my presentation today because my brain does not function on the level of spontaneity. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead and um, share my screen and then we will be able to jump right in. I'll be dedicating this artist's talk to one of my most enduring artistic preoccupations, the writing of science fiction novelist, Octavia E. Butler. The writings in life of Octavia E. Butler are currently in the throes of a profound and overdue moment of recognition. Most notably her futurist novel, Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents, which have been heralded for their eerily predictive storylines about an apocalyptic America that feels uncannily and terrifyingly familiar. Movies and television series adaptations are in the works 15 years after her death. Photographs of journal pages from her archives housed at the Huntington Library in San Marino circulate on social media. There are graphic novels, reissues of her novels and stories, footage surfacing from archives, musical compositions and performances inspired by her work and a cultural outpouring in a variety of disciplines dedicated to honoring Butler's legacy. The first time I heard about Octavia E. Butler's novel, Wild Seed was in Chicago in 1992. It was a story a friend from college told me while I sat in the living room of a mutual friend in the hot dusk of summer, I was visiting for a week and during the day, I dedicated myself to reading my host's massive collection of vintage X-Men comics. In the evening, we visited friends. While talking with one of our friends about the comic book storylines I devoured at that afternoon, she asked me, have you ever read Octavia Butler? There's a book called Wild Sea and proceeded to tell me the story. I was captivated. Most people hate a spoiler. I happen to be one of those rare people who sometimes ask for them. I call friends who've seen episodes of television shows I haven't seen and ask them to tell me what happened. If someone tells me I should read a book, I occasionally ask them to tell me about it. It's not a spoiler, it's a version. A version filtered through the imagination of another story lover. Sci-fi, sidebar. I once in my teens performed in a car ride a reenactment of the scene in Aliens where Ripley fights the mother. My friend's version of Wild Sea was so spectacular, I left the apartment the following day in search of the book. I found the last copy in a bookstore basement that I would discover years later was the legendary Wicker Park performance space for black and brown poets and artists in Chicago, Lit X. I spent the rest of my week in bed, alternating between pages of Wild Seed and the well-loved pages of that extensive X-Men collection. Never in my life had I read anything as fantastic as Butler's writing that also felt so real. As a student of Pan-African studies, I marveled at her ability to alchemize the transatlantic slave trade, African folklore, womanist theory and practice, 
and the history of early North American settler colonialism and the supernatural so seamlessly. I finished the book in 48 hours, tears staining the final pages. I wanted to start all over again. Like a good Butler devotee, I became near obsessed about locating and reading her books. I returned to college and spent hours in the library checking out every book with her name on it. This was pre-internet, pre-Amazon. There was no clicking by, only my drive to dig deep in dusky bookstores and an intimate understanding of the Dewey Decimal System. Once I accidentally terrorized a classmate by insisting she read Clay's Ark. She says she still has nightmares 20 years later from the experience. I read Clay's Ark at least three times since then. Wild Seed, however, remains the jewel in the crown of my Butler-inspired imaginings. In 2006, after her abrupt passing, I began working on an artist book titled Seed, The Book of Eve, a collection of mixed media collages inspired by her novels. I designed the book as a series of two page or what I call two panel fold out collages that represent images or ideas from each of Butler's books from Pattermaster to Fledgling. The artist book was created as a response to the grief I felt from Butler's death and my frustration around the lack of cinematic adaptations of her works. At that time, there were no visual product productions that pointed to Butler's writing. So I was determined to make them. Each collage in the book was handmade, a ritual of image seeking, cutting, arranging, pasting. I worked on one image at a time, selecting passages or occurrences in the novels that most resonated or overall th themes addressed in the works. I was very conscientious about creating images where Black women were centered since all of Miss Butler's novels position Black women at the front of the narrative. I sought also to expand the idea of the page. Many of the collages of Seed, the Book of Eve, fall outside or expand beyond the borders of the page, and each of the page panels spill over and into the next. The project was supported by a small grant from the city of Chicago in 2007 to continue developing it. And later I exhibited prints from the book as a final culmination of the project. See, the Book of Eve has expanded into a number of iterations over the years, including a remixed version of the book I created in 2007, a science book titled Children of the Stars that I altered through interventions of the collages from Seed. Prints from the original artist book have recently been exhibited in Miami, Santa Cruz and Santa Cruz and appear as the artwork for books and albums by writers, scholars and musicians also inspired by Butler's writing and life. Most recently, one of the collages serves as the artwork for the acclaimed podcast, Octavia's Parables by Adrienne Marie Brown and Toshi Reagan. The 2013 narratives of Naima Brown is my visual love letter to Wild Sea. Originating as a short story I wrote about a young woman who discovers that, she'd inherit, that she's inherited a supernatural genetic ability to shapeshift, the story is told through handmade paper, synthetic hair, and mixed media. Hair and handmade paper both serve as material and storytelling devices and the objects are carriers for the Gothic, the mythological and metaphysical, inheritance and the grotesqueries of girlhood. The 2013 narratives of Naima Brown also deals in residue, shedding and what's left behind in the shifting. The natural world, shells, fur, plant fibers, feathers, bone, is a mesh in the paper alongside synthetic hair, generating complex, deceptive, and sometimes disturbing textures and topographies. It's a project designed to unnerve in a way, in the way that some of Butler's stories horrify and get under our skin. The origin story contains subtle nods to multiple black and pop cultural texts and references, including Foxy Brown and Jackie Brown, 
John Coltrane's Naima, Carol's Alice in Wonderland, 1980s horror cult classic Cat People, and of course, Butler's Wild Sea. So many of these photographs here are installations of the very first time that I installed the 2013 narratives of Naima Brown. It's multiple vantage points within the space. Much of the floor was covered with handmade paper objects, kind of sculptural in nature, uh, many of them resembling skin and all kinds of residues of the body. This is a piece that both functions as a runner in the installation and also can be shown as a wall piece as well. It's handmade paper um, with a lot of other kinds of um, activity <laughs> going on here, <laughs> organic and otherwise. This is a photograph that I took in 2019 in my neighborhood, Chicago. I did not stage this, I stumbled upon this image. But it was, um, you know, shocking and kind of grotesque to me um, in a lot of ways and disturbing in the way that I feel like uh, the work is. So when we talk about art mimicking life and life mimicking art, sometimes that does occur. To take root among the stars. To take root among the stars is, is an adjustable paper mural depicting Afrofuturist and Afro-surrealist preoccupations of space travel and mysticism in the Black imagination. Begun in 2016 on an artist residency at the Center for Afrofuturist Studies, this speculative mixed media map consists of handmade paper, vintage magazine articles, dream book pages, and other archival material. Cyanotypes, photographs, and handwritten transcriptions from historical, speculative, and pop culture sources. The project takes its title from a line in Butler's prescient novel, Parable of the Sower, published in 1993. The destiny of Earthseed is to take root among the stars. The historical and ahistorical record, the archive and the citation, citation as eloquently expressed in Catherine McKittrick's Dear Science and Other Stories are all significant underpinnings of to take root among the stars. It is designed to function as a speculative poetic tracing of evidence of Afrofuturist and Afro-Surrealist thought throughout the 20th century until the present. The installation never appears the same way twice as curators are invited and encouraged to arrange the work or organize the information according to their own conceptual sensibilities. Choosing to exhibit as much or as little of the entire artistic archive that comprises the project. I consider this project to be an ongoing, lifelong endeavor. These are detailed shots and images of To Take Root Among the Stars as, they have, as, as it has been exhibited over the years that I've had it. Um, it has had different um, periods of uh, really a, a intense interest, I'll put it like that, you know, where it's been requested um, to exhibit in particular shows and it's shown pretty widely. And again, this is a project that I feel like I will be adding to and, and developing, you know, throughout my lifetime. I feel like the information and the traces, the historical and speculative traces um, of what we have come to, you know, to describe as Afrofuturists or Afro-surrealists, they both have very long histories um, that go beyond this century and go beyond this time period. And so I'm very interested in tracing uh, what I would consider to be evidences, right, or appearances or mentionings of things that may be supernatural or metaphysical, whether they be in songs, whether they be in books, whether, you know, it's just a very broad spectrum um, where I'm pulling these sources. And some of the images that are 
embedded in handmade paper, um, much of the handmade paper that is included in this ex in this particular installation in this particular project um, are handcrafted and hand designed by me to kind of reflect some of these ideas and notions. So finally, last but certainly not least, when it comes to my engagement um, with the work of um, the great Octavia E. Butler, the fantastic science fiction writer and seer really, um, is this final project here, the Octavia E. Butler Tarot Deck, which will be published by AK Press. Um, we're hoping that that will debut but before the end of this year, 2021. Um, we're operating on, you know, divine time as it comes to this project. So, you know, it will be in the world at exactly the right time that it should be. But we are making extreme progress um, with, this, with this project. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this one, not too much because I want, um, I don't wanna, I don't wanna ruin the element of surprise. <laughs> when it comes to this project, this is very much still in formation, still gestating, uh, you know, as, as it were. So um, what you see here are the individuals who are involved in this project and in this process. Um, it was a very incredible process that started about almost six years ago. Um, and these names here that you see uh, on the screen are the individuals who helped to bring this project to life. Um, I was brought in fairly early in the process. Um, it started off as a dream um, that a young person, a, a young person named um, Chelsea Cleveland had. And Chelsea um, saw the deck in a dream. And so uh, Chelsea approached Adrienne Marie Brown, uh, the activist and writer, um, and mentioned this to, to Adrian and Adrian and Chelsea kind of joined forces and invited me in on the game and then it just expanded and exploded from there. So um, the task was to join them on a quest, right? To create a tarot deck that Chelsea saw in a dream. The deck was inspired by the work of Octavia E. Butler. Um, and of course I was terrified and thrilled by the prospects and the idea and I could not say um, even though it was, you know, pretty daunting because I had to learn, um, really I had to learn about the art of tarot, <laughs> you know, and, and the histories of tarot before I could even really dive into recreating images or thinking about images that would um, be appropriate, right? And that would also honor the legacy of Ms. Butler. Um, that was very important, I think, to all of us in this process is that we continually point back to uh, the incredible wealth of information and the tools of survival that Octavia E. Butler has left for us. Um, much like the varied and eclectic communities and families that populate Butler's novels, this project evolved to include a constellation of formidable thinkers, seers, writers, activists, organizers, herbalists, artists, and designers. Set to be published by AK Press very soon, we hope that the Octavia E. Butler tarot deck is a transformative tool of change for whomever engages it. So I'm gonna show a couple of images um, that I created for the deck. I was invited to um, do the major arcana, which um, is a, you know, the large, no, largest number, I think, in the, of, of, of cards in, in the deck. Um, or in a tarot deck. And so I was invited to create images that would, would comprise the major arc. Uh, um, and so what you're seeing here are the images in the raw, you know, um, I'm gonna show you three of them. Um, and you know, of course, they're probably gonna look quite a bit different, you know, in card form, but these are the images that I created. I made all of them by hand, again, using my normal processes. I don't use computer. Um, for anything besides capturing an image. Um, that's, you know, I don't, you know, I, I, I've never, I don't even know how to use Photoshop. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, I'm really useless when it comes to the machine. <laughs> the Afrofuturist was useless when it comes to the machines. Um, so this is, this is my uh, interpretation of the tower. Um, this is my interpretation of the Empress.
and this image will be used as the um, interpretation of shrimp. And that is it. And that is all. Thank you again for inviting me to have uh, to talk about work that I do in its intersections with the great, brilliant Octavia E. Butler. It's lovely to be invited. And so thank you again to the College of DuPage for inviting me to talk. Thank you so much for coming, Krista. We really appreciate it. Um, we have a few student questions for you today. So the first question, um, you have a diverse practice. Um, how do you select a specific medium to resolve an idea? Um, well, I think that the content of what you're trying to do determines what your medium is going to be. So, you know, I, for me, it's not um, too complex, you know, of a thought in terms of determining what, how, how something needs to be expressed, you know? There are certain things that need to be written down. And so they become, you know, pieces of writing or poems, right? There are certain things that demand that they be told in other ways. You know, um, I think with the 2013 narratives of Naima Brown, um, again, you know, that's a, that's a piece that started off as a story. You know, it started off as a story that I wrote. Um, and then from there, you know, I, I began to kind of use that story as a, as a source, as source material to retell the story using handmade paper, retell the story incorporating hair and synthetic hair and, you know, all kinds of other um, plant meat, plant based and fibers. And, you know, I think that the, the content determines the materiality, you know, um, and I think that if you're savvy enough, and if you also are able to connect the dots, you know, what, you know, what is it? What's the best way to convey this idea that you have? You know, what is the best methodology um, of getting your point across? You know, I think that that's really, that's the only thing I can, I can advise there with that. For me, it's very intuitive. It's not something that, you know, it's something that I do consider and deepen my understanding of as the, as the thing progresses, but and sometimes you're on the wrong path and you just have to start all over again. You know, but it's definitely about listening to what the content is to determine what kind of um, what kind of material you know wants to be used. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question: um, In your new city lit interview, you talked about um, when you were making the book Under the Knife, embracing the idea of memory um, being myth and fiction. Um, can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, I, you know, am of the mind state, mindset, that memories are a kind of version. You know, I mentioned this concept of kind of versions, right, of stories um, in my presentation. But I believe that, you know, the memory and the way that we retain certain um, experiences may or may not conform to what actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, especially the more impactful or sometimes traumatic or um, troubling, you know, the experience may be. Um, sometimes even when an experience is really, really wonderful, right, for us, we have a kind of elevated and expanded and um, venerated uh, rec recollection of it. Right, you know, rather than, you know, really kind of mundane thing that it may have actually been. <laughs> so I think that the, the, the mind is very powerful. You know, the mind is very powerful and it can create stories. You know, um, it can create stories from things that have happened and create, create stories of things, you know, that, that have not happened, you know, uh, based upon our feelings, based upon our emotions. I think there's a lot of things at play. And so when I talk about the idea of memory, not necessarily being biblical, right? Um, memory not necessarily being something that, you know, is 100% based on fact, you know, I think that um, I try to deploy that idea very, in a very purposeful, intentional way in Under the Knife, um, you know, that there are memories um, that are shared or have been shared with me, you know, coming up about family members who had departed, right? Who were deceased. And some of those stories may or may not have been true. You know, some of those stories may have been made up or elaborated on or, 
you know, when you play a game of telephone, right? I don't know those of you who have played telephone before where you whisper a secret in somebody's ear and then they pass to the next person, then the next person, the next person, it keeps going down that line. By the end of the line, it could be an entirely different story. <laughs> you know, so I feel like there's room for slippage. There's room for uh, make-believe, you know, um, intentionally and unintentionally sometimes, right? So I just, in, in, this, in, the, in the construct and concept of Under the Knife, um, I definitely wanted to explore and explode that idea that things may or may not be true, that the narrator, who was me, um, ostensibly in that book, um, may not necessarily be a, a reliable narrator, you know, um, that I'm retelling and telling and retelling and telling and retelling and who knows what's true or lying, you know, even in my own experiences. So that's, that's where I come from with that. So Krista, I have one last question for you. Um, in your collages, you're working with a lot of different types of elements. And so the question is, where do you find and how do you curate and bring together those elements? Mm. Well, I think it has to do with aesthetic. You know, I think that any good collage artist is worth their weight in their material. So, you know, for me, um, the kind of images that I make determine the kind of publications and printed matter that I would collect. Right. So I think that it just really depends on what it is that you're trying to get, whatever it is that you're trying to convey. Right. Because, you know, when you're collaging, you're essentially taking photographic material and you're reconstructing that photographic material to create a whole new setting. Right. So for me, you know, there are particular publications that I am drawn to um, due to the kind of images, image making that I want to create. Um, right. And so, you know, you're constantly in a conversation. Um, you're in a conversation with other, 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 you're in a conversation with photographers, you're in a conversation with printed matter, you know, you're in conversation with time, right? What, what, what period of time was that publication that you're using printed in or made in, right? So I think that, you know, you become more adept um, the more you play and experiment, you know? Um, when I first started making collages, I was telling somebody this recently, I, I was very young and I was very broke. <laughs> so a lot of my material was material that I found on the street. You know, I was using litter, essentially. Um, I would take a walk and then I would go collect litter on the streets. You know, I wouldn't recommend that now. <laughs> Not in this day and age, you know, but at that time, um, you know, I was using found canvases from thrift stores, right? And painting over top of old paintings and then reconstructing something over top of that. So I was using what was available to me, you know? Um, and I think that, you know, as I, and I always was, I, simultaneously, I should say, I was also a lover of magazines. I was also a lover of photographic images. I was always a lover of these things. So. You know, my love, my, my natural affection is what drove me towards creating the images, you know. So I think, you know, what should, if you're asking me how do you source material to make collage work or to make work that's, you know, um, sample from other people's work, follow your heart and your gut first. You know, what is it that interests you? And what are those images? And, what, and really exploring what those images mean symbolically also to you, all right? Um, I think it's important, it's not really spoken enough about having a reverence for whatever it is that you're, you're sourcing, having a reverence for whatever it is that you're sampling, having a reverence for, you know, um, photographers. You know what I mean? Having a reverence for the image. Um, and the history of that image before you got hold of it. You know, I think that, you know, we're living in a time, especially with digital um, interventions, right? That we snatch and grab a lot, you know? And I think that it's important to, for me in my practice anyway, it's important for me to have that, um, that deep resonance and love and intellectual relationship with that image so that 
when I am remixing it, I'm, I'm, I'm also bringing into the piece the echoes of that time and the echoes of that people, the people who were involved with that image at the beginning. You know, even if I'm using like that much of the image, you know? I think that makes a big difference. And I think that it makes the work resonate, you know? Um, when you have a love for the material. So, you know, I would just say, you know, be mindful and, um, and float around in places that you wouldn't normally float around in to find some really interesting uh, source material. Yeah. Hope that answers the question. It does, great, thank you so much. Sure. Um, I really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much, Krista. Thank you for inviting me. This lecture will be archived at theccma.org. Um, and I hope that you can join us for our next lecture with Jennifer Newsom and Tom Carruthers. The virtual premiere for that lecture will be Wednesday, September the 29th at 1 p.m. Thanks so much. Thank you.